I'm Sean Kay. I run the International Studies Program and a number of other things here um, at the university. Um, and uh, just want to welcome everybody. I, I would um, like to note this is um, not just a really great academic uh, event tonight. It's also a memorial event for a, a high Wesleyan student, Jeff Eddy, who uh, passed away some time ago. Um, and you'll be hearing more about that in just a minute. But I do ask, uh, for that reason, try to uh, keep your cell phones off. Uh, you know, try to be uh, not disruptive if you need to get up during Q&A and that kind of thing. We really encourage people to sit tight. Uh, and um, once uh, Professor um, Gunguli is done with his talk, I'll come up and we'll moderate the Q&A. And I expect we'll be done here by about 8.30 or so. Um, so um, just really quickly, though, I want to, while I can, uh, take advantage of this to acknowledge Pam Locker, who's back there handing out uh, flyers. None of these events we do would ever be possible without Pam. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I have one other um, just brief announcement. On April 18th, um, I believe I had that date right, it's a Monday of that week, uh, the Arneson Institute, which um, I also um, run, will be hosting a, a really major talk here by uh, a, a journalist writer named uh, Steve Silberman, who has just published a best-selling New York Times book called Neuro Tribes. Uh, it's about the, uh, the history of autism. Um, it's a public health issue, a, a, a social justice issue even. And uh, this is a book that's been winning massive awards uh, around uh, for nonfiction. Uh, the New York Times top 100 uh, list of best books of last year, uh, that kind of thing. So that's uh, coming up in April, just so you can make note on your schedule. So I promised I'd be brief and move out of the way, but I will join back up. But I also, just as a, as a quick personal thought, uh, it's a real privilege to bring Shumit here. Um, uh, in my opinion, there is uh, no finer scholar in the world, indeed, uh, on the area and issue you're going to hear about tonight. And it's something I'm very proud uh, to be able to facilitate that you have a chance to, uh, to, to uh, hear from that directly uh, here tonight. So it's a real privilege. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome Jim Franklin, who will talk a little bit about the Eddie Lecture series. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. I'd also like to welcome you to the John Kennard Eddie Memorial Lecture on World Politics. Uh, this is in memory of John Kennard Jeff Eddie who was a politics and government major at Ohio Wesleyan in the late 1980s. He had a keen interest in international affairs, and actually he and two classmates were on their way to a, some kind of a seminar, a Russian studies seminar, uh, when their car was struck by a reckless driver, killing them. His parents, John and Ellen Eddy, generously contributed to make this lectureship possible. And this has been a fitting memorial to Jeff's uh, memory and his interests, it's a gift that keeps on giving to us at Ohio Wesleyan and to the Delaware community in, in general. It allows us to bring in leading thinkers, scholars, just like, like this year and in years past. Um, so this is such a wonderful legacy uh, for all of us here. So, so thank you very much, Mr. Eddy. Um, I have a note on here also to thank Pam, but since Sean already did that, I guess we don't need to repeat that. But um, uh, now to give a few more remarks and also to uh, introduce our speaker, we have President Rock Jones. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Sean. I'd like to acknowledge the fine work Sean does directing the International Studies Program and year after year bringing an outstanding uh, series of speakers to campus, and, and that uh, tradition continues uh, again this evening. It's a very busy time of the year. There are so many things uh, competing for our time, and I'm grateful to see all of you this evening, and I know that you will find this time uh, well spent. I'm pleased to add my word of welcome to the annual John Kennard Eddy Lecture on World Politics. Uh, as you have heard, this lecture is uh, presented in memory of and to honor the life of Jeff Eddy. And it's a special pleasure to have with us this evening uh, Jeff's father, uh, John Eddy, and I'd like to ask you to join me in recognizing Mr. Eddy, who has traveled from New Jersey to be with us this evening. I'd also like to pause for a moment of reflection on the enormous love and spirit of life that Jeff's late mother and John's uh, late wife, Ellen, uh, blessed us with over the years. Uh, she died 
not so long ago, this is John's first trip back to campus. John, with you, we miss Ellen and we recall her lovely life as we gather uh, this evening. The Eddy Lecture on World Politics has placed Ohio Wesleyan on the national and global map of major lectures for prominent practitioners, senior military officers and diplomats, and scholars from around the world. It has been and remains a hallmark of the Ohio Wesleyan University commitment to an education that brings our students into the world and that brings the world here to our campus. Just one of the many integrated, diverse, and complementary elements of Ohio Wesleyan's outstanding international programming. This year is our 27th gathering for the Eddy Lecture, and we could not have a more important topic uh, than India and its role in our global society. Nor could we have a more prominent scholar than Professor Shumit Ganguly. India is a place uh, near and dear both uh, to Ohio, the Ohio Wesleyan community, but also to my own heart, having had the opportunity to visit there twice over the last uh, five years. Um, and my daughter, uh, as an Ohio Wesleyan student, spent a semester in Pune in India. And on my visits there, I've been able to see for myself the beauty of this extraordinary place and its people. As the world is going through incredible and fast-paced changes, we face an always evolving challenge of understanding how rising powers like India are transforming the international arena, and also to ask what this means for us here in the United States. Shamit Ganguly is widely known to be one of the world's leading scholars of India's domestic politics and foreign policy. Professor Ganguly holds a chair in Indian cultures and civilizations and directs the Center on American and Global Security at Indiana University. He's held prior positions at Michigan State University, Hunter College, and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University, and the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Ganguly has published in the leading international journals and serves on editorial boards of some of the world's most prominent scholarly publications. He's been a fellow and guest scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars, a visiting fellow at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, and the Center on International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. He's the author, co-author, editor, or co-editor of 20 books on South Asia. And just in 2015 and 2016 alone, Professor Ganguly will have published the following books. This is the most impressive. Ascending India and its State Capacity, Heading East, the Dynamics of Security, Trade, and Environment Between India and Southeast Asia, Deadly Impasse, Indo-Pakistani Relations at the Dawn of a New Century, Engaging the World, India's Foreign Policy Since 1947, and the Oxford Short Introduction to Indian Foreign Policy. Shumit Ganguly holds the PhD in Political Science from the University of Illinois in Champaign, an MA in Political Science from Miami University of Ohio, and his undergraduate degree from Berea College in Kentucky. We are fortunate to have with him here this evening and to be able to hear tonight from one of the world's leading experts on India. It's my honor on behalf of Ohio Wesleyan University to welcome as our 27th annual Eddy Lecturer, Professor Shumit Ganguly. Uh, thank you, President Jones, for that exceedingly kind and generous introduction. Uh, I am particularly grateful to my friend and colleague uh, Professor Sean Kay for inviting me and for the Eddy family uh, to dedicate this lecture to their son. And uh, it's uh, uh, obviously a sobering thought, uh, but I am grateful that his memory is commemorated in this fashion. And I am also grateful to Pam Lauker, who took care of all the logistical arrangements and answered all manner of trivial questions on my part uh, in preparation for coming this short distance. Um, it's actually not a bad drive at all on a day like this, on a lovely spring day like this. Um, 
My talk is entitled The Significance of South Asia for World Politics, and that's precisely what I'm going to do. And right at the very outset, what I'd like to do is to uh, give you a sense of the organization of my talk, because most professors are uh, terribly disorganized, and I intend to somehow put an end to that, uh, at least make a stab at it. Um, so first, I'll talk a little bit uh, uh, about sort of the background uh, um, to the significance of South Asia uh, or its lack of significance uh, to uh, the global order during the Cold War. Then I will talk about why it is significant and from the standpoint of what are the positive attributes that make it significant. Then I'll talk about the negative side of the ledger. And then finally, I will talk about why the future might be unlike the past, and South Asia may actually become much more significant in global politics in the years ahead, but with certain important caveats. I mean, no professor is ever going to stick his neck out without appropriate caveats. So in that spirit, I will also put in certain caveats, since if I'm proven completely wrong in the next five years, I can always fall back and I, say, I can say, but I said, there were these three caveats. And hence, you know, it didn't turn out the way I had hoped or expected. At any rate, in 1958, a eminent American anthropologist, a man called Harold Isaacs, wrote a very, very important book. The book was called Scratches on Our Minds, American Images of China and India. And what Isaacs had done is he had gone through newspaper accounts, popular cartoons, uh, images in Hollywood and popu American popular culture of China and India. And the title of the book was emblematic. The title of the book captured it all. China and India, two ancient civilizations, were really nothing more than scratches on our minds. They were mere scratches on American minds because so little was known about these two countries despite the fact that they had rather storied histories and represented two major civilizational entities. Well, that's no longer the case. China looms very large on our minds. All one needs to do is to go to the local Walmart and you would discover that any number of products uh, from cosmetic, cheap cosmetics that you might use to uh, a winter parka made in the People's Republic of China. One also hears about China and increasingly India in the presidential debates about how, there's, uh, to use Ross Perot's very evo evocative term, uh, there's a giant sucking sound. Uh, is the term he used, uh, of any number of jobs being lost, particularly in the Midwest, to Ch uh, China, and then subsequently India. So neither of these two countries constitute scratches on our minds by any means. But it's taken India and South Asia, the region that it's embedded in, much longer to acquire any degree of salience in the US political consciousness or in American society at large. And there are compelling reasons why India and South Asia were, uh, were of much lesser significance and still remains of lesser significance than, say, for example, East Asia, China, and Japan. Um, and there are compelling political and historical reasons for this neglect of South Asia. In considerable part, this neglect of South Asia can be traced to certain policies that India pursued during the Cold War. And as the dominant uh, country in the region, the choices that it made significantly affected the rest of the region and its role in global affairs. What were the choices that India made? Amongst, in, in the realm of economics, India chose to pursue what was referred to in the literature as an autarkic strategy of economic development. A strategy of economic development which focused on self-reliance, on the building up of domestic industries, and not emphasizing export industries, unlike much of East Asia, and 
after the 19, early 1980s China, upon which it has really based its prosperity in considerable measure, India chose a very inward-looking economic strategy, choosing to mostly cut itself off from the world and develop its own industries, relying on what economists uh, referred to as a strategy of infant industries, of protecting industries um, with very high tariff barriers and preventing foreign investment from coming in, but trying to build up uh, domestic industries based upon what economists call a strategy of import substituting industrialization. And as a consequence, its share of global trade and investment was exceedingly small. In fact, until uh, the end of the Cold War, India contributed less than 2% to global trade, despite having a population close to one-fifth of humanity. So, but it was a deliberate strategy, and it really didn't work very well for India, because at the end of the Cold War, based upon its own uh, uh, statistics, close to a third of the population was below the poverty line. And this is drawing the poverty line rather low, with uh, something like a dollar a quarter a day per person. Now bear in mind that purchasing power parity, the, a basket of goods that you can buy for that amount of money goes much further in India than in the United States. But nevertheless, it was an extremely low threshold that was set by the government and close to one third of the population still remained trapped in abject poverty in considerable part because of this very flawed mostly flawed strategy of economic development of not integrating itself into the global economy. Simultaneously, on the political side, India pursued a strategy of non-alignment, which meant it would not join either of the two major ideological blocs, the so Soviet bloc or the Western bloc led by the United States. But in practice, owing to certain geopolitical realities and exigencies, India, particularly after the early 1970s, for all practical purposes, was aligned with the Soviet Union, even though it claimed to be a non-aligned country, to the point that the non-aligned movement really lost much of its moral and ethical significance. And in fact, at one point, a rather unexceptional president of Sri Lanka did make a rather telling point um, at one point, uh, the president of Sri Lanka, uh, in a very uh, sarcastic, mordant note, said that the only two countries in the world, uh, this was a man called Junius Jayawardena, he said that the only two countries in the world that are genuinely non-aligned are the United States and the Soviet Union. <laughs> so that gave you a sense of what had happened to a movement that actually had a certain moral core at one point. But by the late 1970s, it had really become a, a caricature of itself with Cuba heading the non-aligned movement. So that gives you a sense that it had really become a bankrupt movement for the most part. But the Indians were unwilling to abandon that moniker of non-alignment and consequently found itself at odds with the, uh, with the United States, uh, mostly aligned with the Soviet Union, largely because of a fear of China with which it had a major unresolved border dispute. So it was really not until the end of the Cold War that India finally throws off both the shackles of the strategy of import substituting industrialization and this autarchic model of economic development and also this outmoded idea of non-alignment. In fact, as a former prime minister of India in a private conversation with me in New York said, uh, and in a, with a remarkable degree of candor, he said to me, well, it's a mantra, which is a ritualistic incantation, it's a mantra that we have to keep repeating, but whom are you going to be non-aligned against? And I think that was a remarkably honest statement. So with the abandonment of non-alignment and with the abandonment of this uh, autarchic strategy of economic development, which had largely choked off the possibilities of economic development at home and had failed to reduce poverty, 
India finally fitfully embraced more market-friendly policies after the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s. The results have been nothing short of dramatic. And that, in considerable part, explains India's greater salience and significance in world politics. Just to give you a sense of this, after having grown at approximately 3% annually with a 2% with a population growth rate, the effective rate of growth had been 1% over a long period of time, over decades. Shortly after the adop adoption of more market-friendly policies in the 1990s, India's growth rate shot up to 6 to 7% annually. And I'll say more about this later. The dramatic spurt of economic growth led the world to wake up and pay attention to India, and by the same token, to the larger region that it was embedded in, given that it is the dominant power in the region, give both in terms, of, uh, in terms of demography, wealth, military capabilities, and a whole host of other attributes. So, at two and a half decades after the Cold War, the end, India and South Asia no longer appear that insignificant or trivial. Instead, both the principal country in the region and the region itself looms much larger for reasons that are both positive and negative. First, I'm going to talk about the positive side of the ledger, turning to the second part of my talk. To give you a sense of the significance of the region, and particularly India, the dominant country in the region, India, grew at 7.4% in the last quarter, placing it now ahead of the People's Republic of China. It's actually growing faster than the PRC, and the PRC now is in a state of secular decline. The kind of economic development strategy that they had pursued has run aground to some degree, and is fa the country is facing serious uh, econo uh, facing a serious economic conundrum and does not seem to be able to resolve that uh, uh, puzzle that it is confronting at the moment. And there is every expectation based upon predictions of the International Monetary Fund that the 7.4% economic growth rate or better can be sustained in the years ahead. In fact, uh, uh, Christine Lagarde the head of the International Monetary Fund just two weeks ago said that India is the one bright spot in the global economy where she mostly sees doldrums. Not only is the country growing dramatically, because growth alone may not guarantee a reduction in poverty. There has been a dram dramatic reduction in poverty since the embrace of more market-friendly policies. Um, today, India boasts a middle class that is variously estimated between 100 to 250 million people. If one uses the latter figure, that means something close to five times the population of the United Kingdom. I prefer the $100 million figure because I tend to be a little bit skeptical about these nationalistic claims. So even if one accepts the $100 million figure, uh, I mean the $100 million uh, 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 figure, th then you're still talking about 100 million people, which constitutes close to the total population of France and Britain. Uh, it, this is not insignificant. This means lifting an entire, uh, 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 virtually like two entire countries out of poverty. And the middle class uh, in India is, so, is sort of like uh, pre-crisis Greece. If you, if you try to sort of visualize what kind of life they might enjoy, think of, say, pre-crisis Greece, and then you get a sense of the Indian middle class. So obviously, this, we are not talking about middle class standards uh, on the, uh, uh, by the standards of, say, Germany, or, uh, the United, uh, or the United States, but one of the poorer um, uh, southern Mediterranean countries. But life wasn't bad 
for the population of Greece or say Spain or Portugal pre-crisis. So visualize pre-crisis Portugal, pre-crisis Spain, pre-crisis uh, Greece, and you get a sense of what the Indian middle class looks like and the quality of their lives. But not only is this an economic story of transformation, there's also a political strategic story that needs to be told in terms of the significance of India and South Asia. India, which has long been at odds with the People's Republic of China, and despite multiple efforts to resolve a border dispute which goes back to British colonial history, the progress on this border dispute quite aptly has been glacial. Um, th there has been little or no progress. In fact, when they announced after multiple rounds of talks that they, that they, they, had, a, they had had a breakthrough, the breakthrough constituted exchanging maps of the middle sector of the border where there is no dispute. That's progress after about 14 rounds of talks. So basically, the talks remain frozen. Apt metaphor under the circumstances because it's the Himalayan border. Um, uh, at any rate, uh, because of this unresolved dispute with the PRC, and because both countries has se have self-images as major powers in Asia and offering to sort of provide a beacon to the rest of Asia, but offering two markedly different visions of what Asia would look like. India, a noisy, chaotic, uh, messy democracy, the PRC, highly successful in reducing poverty, highly successful in terms of the acquisition of military wherewithal, uh, highly successful in generating economic growth over an extended period of time, but a brutally repressive authoritarian state. And I'll give you just one statistic to drive home the point. The PRC executes more people in a month than India has done since 1947. That gives you an idea of the difference between a communist dictatorship or whatever dictatorship, some variant of, of communism, and a messy parliamentary democracy. And don't take my word for it. This comes from Amartya Sen, one of the world's greatest economists and Nobel, Nobel laureates in economic science. He's the one who cited this in a public lecture um, at my own university where I had the privilege of inviting him. So that gives you a sense of the degree of repression. So yes, a terribly messy, disorganized, democracy which is cacophonous and frequently cannot get anything done, but at least abides by some notion of the rule of law. Hence, the Indian Supreme Court has a doctrine which says, only in the rarest of rare circumstances will we send someone to the gallows. And even that is vigorously contested by civil society in India. So, two contrasting visions of what Asia might look like. And because of the unresolved border dispute, these two states are fundamentally at odds. And coupled with that, not only have we witnessed the economic rise of the PRC, but the increasing assertiveness, and some would even argue aggressiveness, on the part of the PRC in various parts of Asia, not just along the Himalayan border, but most prominently in the South China Sea, where it's engaged in building a series of islands on coral reefs, pouring concrete into the ocean, and laying claims uh, uh, all the way from the Philippines to Vietnam to Japan. The only country in the world, in Asia, that must have been a Freudian slip, uh, the only country in Asia that can serve as a strategic bulwark against the PRC, especially if it continues to engage in this form of territorial and maritime expansion, is India. And consequently, 
it's hardly surprising that there has been growing strategic cooperation w between India and the United States over the last decade, spearheaded by their respective navies. The ambit of cooperation in the recent past, within the past couple of years, has dramatically expanded and deepened, involving India, Japan, Australia, and the United States. In fact, now there are routine quadrilateral naval exercises, thereby dramatically raising the profile of India in the Asian order and arguably in the global order. Let me turn to some softer issues, moving away from hard material realities and strategic matters to turn to other issues that are also of consequence and issues that we all too often pay far too much lip service and do not embrace much more fully, much to my dismay, as an American. And that is democracy. We talk a great deal about it. Unfortunately, all too often political exigencies make us embrace dictators. But fortunately, we are not faced with that Hobson's choice anymore so much in South Asia. With the possible exception, well, not possible, with the certain exception of Afghanistan, which basically is more like uh, uh, anarchy rather than anything else, especially as we contemplate the drawdown of American forces and, and NATO uh, forces, the remnants of only the vestiges of which remain at the moment in Afghanistan. With the exception of Afghanistan, to va with varying degrees of success, the entire region has made a successful transition to democracy. This means that the fifth of humanity now enjoys the benefits of democratic rule. Now, is this Jeffersonian democracy at work? <laughs> Far from it. But democracy is a process of long-term construction. It does not, it's not like flipping a switch. It takes a long time to evolve. But the mere fact that you have had open, honest, reasonably fair elections in all these countries and increasing assertiveness uh, on the part of the judiciaries, the growth of civil society in all of these countries bodes extremely well for the future of democracy in South Asia and what thereby it makes a world of difference to the global order. If this could have possible demonstration effects in other parts of the world, that despite widespread poverty, despite the fact of major ethnic cleavages, uh, despite uh, the fact that uh, these are all democratic latecomers, you're still seeing a kind of a rocky, slow transition to democracy, thereby holding up the prospect of democracy elsewhere in the world. <clears throat> Having talked about material and non-material features of the positive side of the ledger, now let me turn to the less desirable side of the ledger, and one has to talk with some degree of candor about it. All of these factors, by the way, that I'm going to talk about have an important impact on world politics. It's just that none of them are particularly felicitous, the list that I'm about to go through. With the possible exception of the Levant, South Asia, sadly, particularly that the nether regions of the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, remains an epicenter of terror. And not just an epicenter of terror, for the region, but an epicenter of terror for the globe. There are organizations operating from that region which have in connections with Al-Qaeda and most disturbingly now with ISIS or ISIL. The connections with ISIL and, uh, 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 or ISIS are much more tenuous. The connections with Al-Qaeda, which has largely been eclipsed by the extraordinary brutality of ISIL, nevertheless remains an important global force and a force for much evil in this world. Many of, of, uh, of Al-Qaeda's ties go have deep roots in South Asia, 
connected to other terrorist organizations which continue to thrive in that region and currently are content with attacking parts of northern India and attacking Afghanistan. But let me assure you that they intend to spread their tentacles much further. This is a source of considerable concern uh, to me and should be to others in this world. To compound matters, the Pakistani military has used many of these terrorist organizations as strategic assets, primarily against India because it has a major ongoing border dispute about which I have written ad nauseum and all my books are remaindered on Amazon so you can get them for a very low price. Um, and some people might even say deservedly so. Um, um, not only has the Pakistani military used them as strategic assets, what is even more disturbing today is that these groups are now acquiring a degree of autonomy. They're slipping out of the grasp of the Pakistani military. So we have the fa all too famous Frankenstein problem that you've created a monster that you may not be able to control anymore. Many of these things, many of these monsters are hydra-headed and they are destabilizing the region and beyond. Other disturbing developments to add to the gloom and doom that I am embarking upon, uh, as, as if we need more in this world. But again, I said I would speak candidly about these matters, and so I will. Against this backdrop of the increasing loss of control over various terrorist groups that it had spawned, nurtured, and supported, Pakistan is now rapidly expanding and transforming its nuclear arsenal because of the rivalry with India. And in considerable part, this is an attempt to deal with India's quest, which I think is equally destabilizing, if not more, the quest for ballistic missile defense, something we went through in this country in the, in the 1980s under President Reagan, when he thought he could put an entire bubble over the United States. And any number of scientists and engineers with even minor competence in physics and engineering demonstrated that such a bubble would be anything but leak-proof. And not only that, even if they were good defenses, as several of my political scientist friends pointed out, they would actually be deeply destabilizing because they might give the United States, at least in the eyes of the Soviet Union, first strike advantages and thereby protecting itself, especially if you could put a leak-proof bubble over the United States, a technological bubble, protect itself from a Soviet res uh, nuclear response and thereby uh, ev eviscerate the Soviet Union as a working uh, country. The same arguments that were de deployed against the use of um, uh, uh, ballistic missile defense in this country apply with equal force to South Asia. But unfortunately, India, for reasons of its own, is investing in ballistic missile defense. Nationalistic and chauvinistic Indian scientists are making all manner of utterly outlandish claims, reminiscent of what I heard when I was in graduate school by partisans in this country, in fact, echoing almost the same language about the accuracy of ballistic missile defense, which is mostly under simulated conditions or highly favorable conditions when you already know the trajectory of a missile and you knock it out of the sky and you claim 100% reliability of your system, which is precisely what we were doing with smoke and mirrors. Now, the Indians have learned that lesson from us and are engaged in a similar game of smoke and mirrors, thereby causing a security dilemma, what political scientists refer to as a security dilemma for Pakistan, that the Indians are claiming these are for purely defensive ends, but how do I know that? That this is not really a quest for what is referred to as escalation dominance, to be able to dominate escalation at each level of the ladder and thereby render Pakistan's nuclear weapons useless. 
we can go into this. This is somewhat, somewhat of an arcane, esoteric subject, but I've spent a great deal of time thinking about it, and if anybody's brain is really exercised by this, I'll be happy to go into it at greater length. Why do I bring this up? I bring this up because there's the potential of a deeply destabilizing arms race in the region, which others might also foolishly emulate. Never underestimate the human capacity for pursuing you know, acts of folly, especially when others have already demonstrated the danger, danger of that pathway. Uh, others might also be tempted to pursue a strategy of escalation dominance in volatile regions of the world, uh, especially as the Indians continue to make these outlandish claims about the uh, accuracy and the reliability of, of ballistic missile defense. We can talk more, much more about this if, if this sounds rather opaque or vague. Uh, I recognize that I am speaking uh, almost in telegraphic language on this subject. Um, uh, so I can elaborate and uh, make it much more lucid uh, should someone be interested. I don't believe there's an imminent prospect of war, let alone nuclear war, but the strategic uh, trends in the region make me far less than sanguine. If these trends continue in this fashion, we could end up with a particularly toxic and volatile mix. But that's not the only bad news. There's further bad news. The worst news, the even more immediate bad news comes from the PRC. Because India is increasingly moving into the Indian Ocean, increasingly collaborating, as I said, with Australia, Japan, and the United States, the PRC is ratcheting up pressure along the Himalayan border, the unresolved border. And they are engaged in what are referred to in the literature of strategic studies as limited probes. Little probes along the border to test Indian readiness, Indian awareness, Indian alertness along the border. But again, this has es escalatory potential. Even though nobody wanted war, these limited probes could escalate along a very volatile border. And that's the last thing the world needs, is a, the possibility of yet another war, even if it's kept limited between China and India. And finally, I would be completely remiss if I did not talk about one other feature from the landscape of South Asia, which is profoundly disturbing. If anybody... Uh, imagined that I have some residual sense of nationalism being of Indian origin, this will effectively put it to rest. And that is my deep-seated fears about the rise of illiberal nationalism in South Asia, and particularly in India, under the present regime that is in power. The present regime in power is trying to dismantle a legacy that had been carefully nurtured against all odds since 1947, and more accurately 1950, when India adopted a liberal, democratic, and plural constitution based upon the American constitution, British common law, and the Irish constitution. Very self-consciously developed a secular democratic constitution. Secularism has undergone many body blows earlier in India, but for the first time, one has a regime in India that is explicitly opposed to secularism. To me, that is one of the most disturbing, most profoundly disturbing features of the Indian political landscape, and one that could have ripple effects well beyond South Asia. If a country with such inherent diversity as India adopts an increasingly illiberal spirit and worse still, practices, this could have profoundly corrosive consequences for liberal democracy across the world. Of course, we are doing such an extraordinary job in our own country at the moment in terms of protecting liberal democracy, but that's the subject of another lecture. Um, so I don't want to sanitize or in any way anesthetize you 
from some of the more disturbing features uh, of the political and strategic landscape of South Asia, having initially talked about very sa uh, sanguine and positive developments. So what's the future of South Asia? And how might, be dif how might it be different from the past? How might South Asia assume greater significance in world politics to return to the central theme of my lecture? I think three factors, and here are my caveats, as I mentioned earlier. Much depends on what happens in these three areas. First, we could see a markedly different Pakistan, both at peace with itself and with its neighbors, most importantly with its behemoth neighbor India, with which it has had a rivalry since birth, since its genesis in 1947 at the end of the British colonial empire in South Asia. If one were to witness an end to the privileged status of the military in Pakistan, one could see a markedly different Pakistan with democracy being consolidated, with greater respect for the rights of minorities, and yes, there are substantial religious and sectarian minorities within Pakistan, even though it's a predominantly Muslim state, and a Pakistan which might be at peace finally with its behemoth neighbor, trading normally, um, engaging in people-to-people -people contacts, and producing a markedly different South Asia as, as a consequence. But much of this hinges on an end, not merely an end to military rule, which has taken place, but a return of the military to its proper role in the barracks and not this bloated presence where it distorts everything from the economy of the country to the society of the country to protect, protect its extraordinarily privileged status. To give you a sense of the privilege of this military. Ahmed Rashid, one of Pakistan's best journalists, has pointed out um, that close to 35% of the national budget goes to the military. Another 30 odd percent goes to debt servicing and the remainder for everything else. This is not a recipe for economic and political success over the long term particularly when you're faced with a competitor like India, which is growing at almost 7.5% annually. So an end to the privileged status of the military in Pakistan. And how might that come about? I leave that deliberately dangling so one, some, someone can ask a question rather than giving you the answer of how I envisage such structural change taking place. Second, Sustaining economic growth in India and thereby producing a rising tide that lifts all boats in South Asia. If India prospers, the rest of the region stands to prosper. It can become an economic hub, not just for the region, but for Asia and beyond. Some of that is already taking place right now, but sustaining it will require significant attention to a number of policies that have simply been kicked down the road uh, because they are politically costly and no one wants to grasp those particular nettles. And finally, to end on a particularly sobering note, but one that I find ineluctable, one that I find absolutely inescapable, and I would be utterly remiss and Pollyanna-ish if I didn't talk about this. And that's containing the furies of ethnic nationalism, not just in India, but across the region. Because those furies still exist in the region. They still lurk in dark corners and not so dark corners. And they feed upon one another. When ethnic minorities are oppressed in India, it has consequences across the region. When ethnic minorities are treated badly in other parts of the region, it fuels the anger of the Hindu right in India, and thereby, in turn, leads to the diminution of rights of other minorities within India. These uh, furies routinely feed upon one another. This is perhaps one of the most uh, uh, compelling dangers facing the region, and there is no way to elide over it. 
If the region can somehow grasp these three particular nettles, then I see a future for the region markedly different than it has been over the last 70 years. And the region finally, one-fifth of humanity, finally taking its rightful place in global affairs. Thank you very much. Do you want to sit or you prefer to sure. uh, Whatever you think is appropriate. Uh, if you're comfortable, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you. That was a tour de force uh, of uh, a wide-ranging and complex region. I, I've got a couple questions, but why, be, before I do that, why don't we throw it out first and see if we can get things started from the audience. Uh, yes, ma'am, over here, and then we'll come to... Uh, go ahead. If you can speak up, it's a little hard to hear from... Oh, she's got a mic, even better. Great. Thank you. All right, okay. What do you believe are the s cultural, political, et cetera, factors that have led to the, what you say is a de-emphasis on secularism in Indian politics, and maybe if you have time, um, how does that maybe parallel with America's same pattern on de-emphasis of secularism in our government? Yeah. Um, the emphasis on secularism grew out of the Indian nationalist movement. There were anti-secular strands in the Indian nationalist movement, but those did not come to the fore because the party that brought India its independence had, was exceptionally fortunate in having a coterie of individuals at the top who were passionately committed, uh, both personally and professionally, to a secular state. A part, a part of it was an ethical commitment because they genuinely believed in secularism. Part of it was instrumental because they recognized that in the absence of secularism, a democracy would not mean genuine democracy because it would because with substantial religious and cultural minorities in India, unless you had a state that um, uh, respected other faiths, and by the way, that is an important difference from the American vision of secularism, the Jeffersonian vision of secularism, which calls for a wall of separation between church and state. That wall may be pretty pockmarked at the moment, but that's another story. Uh, the, uh, at least at the level of principle, the Jeffersonian vision of sep uh, uh, secularism is a separation of church and state. Um, in India, it's not a separation of church and state because India's national leaders very early recognized that in a society which is imbued with religiosity in every facet of life, it's impossible to have this kind of separation. So what instead India chose was a very different vision of secularism, one which sought to respect every faith. Uh, uh, and th that arrangement worked fairly well into the 1970s. But in the 1970s, owing to electoral exigencies, politicians, starting with Prime Minister Mrs. Ga Indira Gandhi, started to make uh, gestures, non-secular gestures, to the majority community in an attempt to build a political base. And unfortunately, that opened the floodgates. And today, India is paying a very high price for having abandoned some of the principles of secularism uh, uh, from the uh, mid-1970s onwards. There has been a steady decline in the commitment to secularism in India, and today one has a explicitly anti-secular regime in power. Um, there was another gentleman here, and then I'll come over here. Is that, please, yeah. So I'm sure you've been asked this question before, but uh, I wanted to get your uh, opinion on this. So what do you think the chances are of a um, China and Pakistan forming an alliance to attack India or India and Japan forming an alliance to attack Pakistan? <laughs> 
Um, the prospects of India and Japan aligning uh, uh, to uh, fight a war with Pakistan, uh, that's one thing I can say with certainty won't happen in my lifetime. Um, I'll go out on a limb and say that. That's a very dangerous thing for a political scientist to do. But this I am so sure of. I mean, the sun would have to rise in the West before this would happen. So the prospects of that would really require a change in sort of global orbits, um, you know, celestial orbits uh, or uh, earthly orbits, whatever. Um, uh, uh, there is... Uh, I won't even say tacit, there is explicit collaboration between China and Pakistan. Uh, but the possibility of China and Pakistan coming together to fight a war against India, uh, I think is an unlikely, though not impossible prospect, because in prior wars, there has been small elements of strategic cooperation, but a war of that order would attract far too much attention from the global community for the possibilities of the expansion of such a conflagration. And thereby, I, I suspect the, the likelihood of that is still relatively small, unlike the other one, which I'm almost prepared to write off. Let me, let me uh, do a follow-up on that. Um, this is not military related, but, but actually tr strategic trade. So <clears throat> what would be the uh, if the Trans-Pacific Partnership deal were to fail, what would be the ripple effects or implications for U.S.-India relations? Probably very little because uh, India really hasn't uh, been part of the TPP. Yeah. Uh, in considerable part, the uh, trade relationship between the United States and India is strictly bilateral. Uh, and there are several trade, ongoing trade disputes uh, including one where I think we are completely in the wrong, we meaning the United States, or, or sanctioning India for supporting solar power, yeah. uh, providing small subsidies to solar power. I mean, this is a case of the physician heal thyself. And furthermore, we want to deny India solar power when we are hectoring them not to use coal. Uh, I mean, talk about the most blatantly contradictory policy. Uh, I mean, on this occasion, I think there's rough justice on, uh, on the part of the Indians. Well, that's pertinent on the nuclear energy issues, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, I was thinking about it a little differently, though. If, oh, okay. if, if we are, if we end up with a vacuum ourselves yes. in the, this is Asia Pacific a yes. bit more. Yes. But that, how does that factor into India's strategic assessment of the position? I mean, if we leave a vacuum to China, yeah, and, and American leadership in the Asia Pacific is suddenly in question. Um, then, how does that factor into India's strategic calculations, especially with regard to China? Yeah. Oh, and I, I understand the significance of the question much better the way you restated it. Uh, I didn't quite construe it correctly. The they, they would be used to that too. I, <laughs> I think it's an occupational hazard uh, for us, Sean. Uh, the um, um, the funny thing is, the Indians will not publicly say this. They are terrified of an American withdrawal from Asia. Uh, publicly, it's sort I mean, it's best captured in a phrase that a friend of mine, uh, who actually studied at MIT but never finished his dissertation, like many political scientists, uh, <laughs> Uh, I shouldn't be saying this amongst young people. This is a, you know, you must finish your dissertations if you go to graduate school. That's a terrible example to cite. Uh, uh, he should be roundly condemned, uh, uh, despite the fact that he became a minister uh, in the previous government. Uh, he uh, once said, there's a wonderful phrase he used at a talk at the Asia Society in New York. He said, Yankee, go home and take me with you. Uh, so. Publicly, the Indians will not say, no, no, you know, we are terrified that the United States might withdraw. But you walk through the corridors of power and you interview key decision makers. Their great anxiety is that after this election, we might become isolationist. Mm -hmm. And this terrifies them, the notion of an American power, va of a power vacuum in Asia that is filled rapidly by China is their ultimate nightmare. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I lived in Pakistan for many years. I had 
Joe Biden from Pakistan, I think Haiti is where it's at. However, from Pakistan's point of view, they look across the border and they see the rise of the BJP, and that has confirmed the rationale for the creation of Pakistan to start with, and they look across the border to the, along the, uh, of the Iran line, and they, uh, they see the, uh, the, the Indians play, they playing games with the Afghanistan and using Afghanistan against Pakistan. So naturally, Pakistan has a concern for its own, its own existence. Yeah, if you couldn't hear, just uh, we do have the mic, but um, the question is generally about the, the, the strategic kind of crossroads between India and Pakistan, and to what extent could, what was the last part? The rise of the BJP. Oh, the, yes, exactly. The, okay. Yeah. Um, um, this is the ultimate irony, that the BJP is its own worst enemy. The BJP is playing into the... Uh, a rather discredited notion that Hindus and Muslims constitute primordial nations. That was the basis of the creation of Pakistan, that Muslims could not find safe haven in a democratic, secular, liberal India, because these were nothing more than words, that these might, might, might be constitutional principles, but nobody was going to abide by them. And consequently, a separate homeland for Muslims had to be created. The BJP is confirming that hypothesis. And that's the ultimate irony, that uh, here they are uh, uh, pursuing policies that marginalize 14% of India's population. Uh, saying this, uh, as I even discovered, uh, at dinner at the International Studies Association with a group of uh, colleagues of Indian origin um, sort of m made them extremely upset. And I said, look, I'm sorry. I look upon these things as an analyst, not as a cheerleader. And what the BJP is doing is marginalizing 14% of the population. And even if you don't have any ethical concerns, you shouldn't do this for instrumental reasons because you're confirming the rather bizarre claim that Hindus and Muslims constitute these hermetic entities which cannot have anything in common, cannot have any possible human confraternity. Um, but the Afghanistan part is an invention. That is an invention of Rawal Pindi, the uh, general headquarters of the Pakistani military. The Indians have resisted repeated Afghan demands for arming them, for stationing troops in Afghanistan. The Indian military presence in Afghanistan is like a gossamer. It's wafer thin, and it's largely designed to protect Indian investments in Afghanistan, which have been attacked by the Afghan Taliban, supported by Pakistan. So the Afghanistan part, I just don't buy. That's a fiction created by general headquarters in Rawalpindi uh, for American consumption. But I entirely buy your first argument. In fact, I would state it with greater force than you did. You were polite in your characterization. Um, uh, Karen, and then over here. There's a slender, slender, but absolutely brilliant book published by Cambridge University Press in 1997. And some guy called Shumit Ganguly wrote it, <laughs> which tells you everything you need to know about it. And it's also remaindered on Amazon. <laughs> uh, no, that, that said, what do I think about Kashmir? Uh, um, uh, the only solution to the Kashmir dispute that is not a pie in the sky or the stuff of doctoral dissertations or senior theses uh, you can write anything you want in those. Uh, but uh, in terms of practical policy making, the only settlement is a settlement along the line of control where the two sides have troops looking at each other eyeball to eyeball. Uh, there is going to be no territorial reorganization of Kashmir for a number of compelling reasons. The Indians will not concede. Um, the, uh, uh, the Pakistanis want all of Kashmir, which is not going to happen. And the Chinese don't want territorial uh, reorganization either, because that could have demonstration effects for them. 
So the best way to resolve the dispute is to simply um, uh, uh, settle along the line of control. A colleague at Georgetown, uh, Christine Fair, and I wrote an article about a year ago in the Washington Quarterly called Lives on the Line. Uh, and that basically lays out, critiques all the arguments uh, for various, um, frankly, cockamamie schemes um, uh, for the resolution of the Kashmir dispute. And we finally conclude that set with minor territorial adjustments, settle along the line of control and move on to other things. Yeah, a, a follow up on both of those questions. Yeah. Um, so one of your points about sort of future scenarios was on um, uh, positive alternative directions for Pakistan. And of course there's a wide range of things they need. Um, from civil society to more diversified economy, exports and things like that. Certainly they need to not spend so much money on defensive posturing as well. Um, but here's the, t the tough question I, I think, which is what does India need to do? And what, what things might India need to do to help foster that direction within Pakistan? Or are there things that India can do? in that direction? The most important thing that India can do is uh, really twofold. First, treat its Muslim minority as equal citizens of India. Mm. If it does that, it really makes Pakistan look silly. Mm. Um, you know, if Muslims are treated with a degree of uh, respect and uh, uh, equality that they deserve. Uh, the rationale for Pakistan really is undermined. That's the most and the most compelling demonstration that this whole business, that ethnicity alone can be the basis of a state, becomes undermined. And Pakistan uh, cannot then continue to claim, and one of its, by the way, more fatuous claims is that it is the defender of Muslim rights. Mm. Uh, one only has to look at the plight of the Shia in Pakistan to talk about how wonderfully they treat their own minorities. Mm. Okay? To the point that the Iranians are increasingly exercised about the tiny Shia minority in Pakistan because of their maltreatment on a routine basis, let alone the treatment of Ahmadiyas, who are a tiny sect in the city of Karachi who uh, are considered apostates, who are not even considered proper Muslims. So for Pakistan to talk about minority rights elsewhere is a bit rich. But as long as the BJP continues to marginalize Muslims, hound Muslims, maltreat Muslims, the Pakistanis will have, and particularly the political leadership, will make political hay out of this. So that's the first one. The second one is inside baseball. Uh, but that's, since that, that's what we do for a living, uh, I'll, uh, and since many of your students are here, there are a couple of military postures that the Indians at conventional and strategic levels are pursuing or, and have deployed, which are deeply destabilizing. For example, it needlessly has two strike commands very close to the Pakistani border in the Punjab. At that level, it creates a security dilemma for Pakistan. The Indians say, no, no, these strike commands are only there in the event of an emergency. It's if such an exigency arrives, we can rapidly mobilize them. As a Pakistani looking out over the border, and I see these powerful mechanized divisions sitting there, I say, no, you know, you guys, have caused us grief in the past. You're much larger. Those can slice right through my defenses. It's like a hot butter, I mean, hot knife through butter. This is not something I can be sanguine about. The Indians could very easily move those strike commands. That's one. The other is something I mentioned, this illusory quest for ballistic missile defense. From a Pakistani standpoint, um, this looks like an attempt 
at uh, uh, the, the, uh, the search for first strike counter force options. Mm. It's a pipe dream. The Indians wouldn't have the requisite intelligence. They wouldn't be able to miniaturize their warheads. They wouldn't uh, be able to carry out such a coordinated strike. But that's not what military planners believe in. They think of the worst case scenarios. The Pakistanis are no different. From a Pakistani standpoint, this is an attempt at Indian escalation dominance. Uh, and I've written scathingly about this, but who cares? Uh, let's see. Uh, there was somebody here, and then I'll come over. Yes, please. Here we have a mic if you want it. It'd be easier so people can hear you. <laughs> you don't have to sing or anything. You can okay. just. Um, you mentioned the significance of um, India's naval capabilities. In, in light of um, their economic growth, can you see them surpassing China's naval, um, naval capabilities? And if so, would the United States want to remain in control? Um, or want to do a power share and kind of reduce the amount of forces in the region? Uh, that's, an, uh, that's a fascinating question. Uh, uh, in the foreseeable future, I don't see the Indians being able to surpass uh, the People's Liberation Army Navy. Uh, the PLA is much more advanced. And the biggest problem is that Indian uh, domestic defense industries, uh, uh, to say they've been inefficient is about the most charitable word I can come up with. Um, they've basically been rat holes. Uh, that's a more accurate description. They've poured enormous amounts of money into building a do do domestic defense infrastructure. Much of it has simply flowed into the Indian Ocean uh, with no appreciable results. And the naval component has been somewhat better, but these are still fairly obsolescent vessels that they are developing. Um, uh, they engage in a lot of smoke and mirrors because unlike in um, uh, the United States where we have something called the Government Accountability Office, <coughs> there is a similar entity in India and it's only in the last decade has the uh, uh, Comptroller and Accountant General of India, which is similar to the Government Accountability Office, is finally becoming a real watchdog and revealing problems of India's uh, d defense industry. It recently came out with a scathing report on what's called the light combat aircraft, uh, which most of us refer to as the late coming aircraft, um, uh, which was supposed to be an indigenous airplane. The only thing that's indigenous about it is probably the paint uh, on the airplane. <laughs> maybe the canopy, maybe the plexiglass canopy. Uh, uh, the engine is American, the avionics are from Israel, the radar is from, um, the, uh, uh, from France, and the fire control mechanisms from the, uh, Russia. Um, so, you know, extrapolate that to naval uh, uh, efforts, uh, it's going to be a long time coming, okay? Um, so, would the U.S. Um, outsource some of this? It already is. Uh, the growth of naval cooperation um, is hardly accidental. And particularly something called the Malabar exercises, which are now held annually uh, uh, amongst a quadrilateral, Japan, Australia, United States, India. You, you have considered it significant, though, that the United States included the Indian Ocean and the concept of the Asia pivot, too. I mean, yes. That, that was a, yes. a broader reach. Absolutely. And in fact, a term is now, a term of art is emerging. It's called the Indo-Pacific. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, do you think the Congress party will be able to make a comeback after being wiped out in the last general election? Um, if not, do you see other parties in the area that they have sort of uh, secular, pluralistic approach? The Congress party is currently in its rigor mortis. The only people who don't know are the people who are dead. Um, they are zombies, basically. The party has lost its intellectual moorings. The party has lost any moral, uh, ethical uh, precepts that it once had. It has, its grassroots have withered away. 
And other than that, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so that's the state of the Congress party. The only hope lies really in regional parties, which may be, co which may be corrupt, venal, uh, and uh, otherwise not particularly attractive, but they know they have to win office. And there is an extraordinarily mobilized uh, and politicized populace, which is increasingly uh, making demands on the political system. And they recognize that unless they can deliver the local tap, or they build a metal road, or put in a schoolhouse, or one more clinic, in the next five years, they're going to be out of office. So they may do it not because of a commitment to certain moral, ethical, or ideological principles, uh, and instead, simply for straightforward instrumental reasons. And minorities also have become highly vocal in India. And consequently, you have to build coalitions sometimes. And the building of coalitions sometimes necessitates ratcheting down your rhetoric. The BJP has this bizarre idea that it can create a Hindu monolith by seizing upon certain symbols, by seizing upon certain emotive issues, but this is a, it's a disastrous recipe, both ethically and instrumentally. So unfortunately, uh, there is no uh, na nationwide alternative uh, to the BJP. I mean, the Congress would have to sort of rise in Phoenix-like fashion, and I just don't see that on the horizon at the moment. All right, we have time for a few more questions. I'd like to ask one, though. I, I see one in the back. I'll, I'll come to you in just a second. Um, but uh, this is actually, I'm going to ask this on behalf of, uh, of my Europe class, which is here. Okay, so this is actually a little narrow, but, okay. uh, but important in the Indian context. Sure. So, um, so uh, the question I'd ask is about the, the legacy relationship between Britain and India. I mean, I know whole books <laughs> can and have been written on this. Uh, um, also cheap at Amazon, probably too. But, but, but the uh, um, but the question I think remains a significant one, um, not only for India but but for the British too. And and you know, there's all these arguments about the legacy of colonialism and so on, and how that affected the development of the Indian state. And indeed, it's foreign policy too for much of that time as well, as you as you reference. So, I mean, I know that's a, a big topic, but if there were a few key points on that, how you've seen that relationship historically, and how you see it today, uh, in the context of the colonial relationship. Uh, let's start from today. Today, it's mostly a commercial relationship. Um, Cameron wants British investment in India. He wants access to Indian markets. Um, uh, there is still a trickle of immigration, uh, mostly for historical reasons, with families being reunified or some you know, cousins moving, uh, extended family moving to Britain. But the attraction of going to Britain, except for sort of, you know, some nostalgia about Oxbridge and uh, the Rhodes Scholarships and the like, for the most part, uh, people still want to come to the United States. Mm. Uh, the U.S. is a much bigger magnet for India, um, for India and Indians uh, than uh, Britain. There is still a little bit of imperial nostalgia, and there are some who would still like to send their children and sort of get this kind of uh, classical liberal edu arts education at Oxford or Cambridge, but you don't see droves of people going to, say, LSE or SOAS mm -hmm. as you historically used to. There is still some relationship. Mm -hmm. There is also an academic relationship that is developing between certain universities in India and British universities, which basically want money mm -hmm. uh, from India, and Indian industrialists. Yeah, sure. yeah. So there is that relationship that's developing. And they are sort of trying to play up on colonial nostalgia. Mm -hmm. uh, and amazingly enough, there are Indians who will fall prey to that sort of thing. Uh, overlooking the many ills of colonialism. Um, historically, the one thing I want to demolish, because even the New York Times will trot this canard out, and they'll never, they've published any number of my letters except on this issue, where they have made up their minds. Hmm. And that is 
that Britain bequeathed to India its democratic institutions. Mm. Nothing could be further than the truth. In fact, once to be overly self-referential, at a talk at Stanford, I gave such a blistering critique of this idea that even poor Larry Diamond cringed because there was an Englishman in the audience. Um, and he sort of went, hey. uh, not just in the audience, on the panel. There was a British political scientist on the panel. And I said, look, you know, uh, I'm not a postmodernist, so I believe in facts. Mm -hmm. And there's a factual historical record. Uh, and at every stage, the British tried to stultify the growth of democratic institutions in India. I India is democratic because of the genius of the Indian nationalist movement mm -hmm. and their passion and their commitment to democracy and to liberal democracy. Now, what I will concede was the idea indigenous, as some Indian chauvinists are, uh, are prone to saying, nonsense. Uh, it didn't grow out of village-level democracy in India. That's a quaint idea. Save that for the Rotary Club, okay? Um, uh, democracy, the ideas of liberal democracy were appropriated from Britain. Mm. Indian nationalists who studied in Britain mm -hmm. said, why should the, uh, you know, the rights of man be saved, or woman for that matter, be saved uh, for home consumption? These should apply equal, with, to equal force with us. And they're the ones who embedded these ideas in the Indian soil. But the ideas were quintessentially British and, 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 uh, and came from the Anglosphere. That I don't deny. But to suggest that this was some a sort of, you know, uh, a benign legacy of British colonialism is a complete canard. Mm. And it's something that, you know, Cameron and Thatcher and people of their ilk and Boris Johnson uh, might want to trot out. It makes them feel better and sanitizes the terrible record of British colonialism. Or even Neil Ferguson. Neil was the one I was yeah. Thinking. yeah. I mean, my God, I should send you my review of his book from Current History. It'll keep you up at night. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because I not only put him in the grave, but ensured that I put the nails in to the coffin too. Uh, if you, uh, his argument is a positive legacy of colonial structures on the development of these, yeah. Yes. Railroads, schools. Railroads, schools. Yeah. Those were purely for the purposes of extraction. Colonialism was not a benign enterprise. And yes, if they put an end to widow marriage, it was simply a, a, an accident. Uh, rather than some desire to uplift the heathen. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to follow up on that? Or? Um, I am concerned what you're saying about the rise of the BJP, Sorry. and I'm wondering, and the rise of these sec and the rise of these regional powers, what is the future of India? I'm amazed that India has held together so well, given the, the, the ethnic diversity and the language diversity, the religious diversity, it's astounding. Come back. What about the future of India? Um, uh, that's the subject of a Nobel Prize acceptance speech uh, and something I'm utterly incapable of. Um, what's the future of India? I can give you several indicators. Uh, I can't tell you, I can't predict the future. I don't engage in crystal ball gazing, but I can tell you certain trends that I see. One, Indian politics will become increasingly more regional. And as a consequence, certain states will be prosperous, better governed, and will deliver um, goods and services to its population much better than other states. That, that's a given. That's for, certain. that's for certain. Second, and I'll go out on a limb on this one, democracy will survive. Because democracy, as I have argued in print earlier, has become the only game in town. The question is the quality of that democracy. Will it become more illiberal or will it go back to its liberal roots? That I don't know. And on that, the jury is out. But democracy as a form of political organization in India, warts and all, and there are many warts, will survive. I don't think that uh, an authoritarian um, regime um, uh, with, uh, which dismantles the independence of the judiciary, muzzles the free press, uh, chokes civil society, is really possible anymore. 
And ironically, I thank Mrs. Gandhi for that. Because, Mrs. Gandhi, because for 22 months, she imposed a state of emergency in India, largely to sh uh, protect her own political hide. Um, and as a consequence of that, many of us, including yours truly, who said, ah, democracy is nothing but a mere gloss in India. We ate crow after that because we discovered what the alternatives could be like. So even the communists who had said, oh, civil liberties are, are just bourgeois liberties. The only thing that matters are material you know, liberties, you know, health care, food, housing, education. Those are the things that matter. Civil liberties we can dispense with. Once they were in an Indian prison, they discovered how delightful civil liberties were when they were taken away from you. Even the communists said, ah, upon consideration, civil liberties do matter, especially when they affect us. Huh. So Mrs. Gandhi very nicely inoculated India against the, uh, the authoritarian temptation. But I, wa I want to conclude my response to you by alluding to something that really happened. Stephen Wiseman, who was one of the best reporters of the Washington Post at the time in India, and subsequently joined the New York Times. Wiseman was a reporter for the Post, and he went out to some dusty village outside New Delhi, right after Mrs. Gandhi had lifted the state of emergency and had lost the election when she had held elections. And through an interpreter, he interviews this wizened, poor, illiterate villager. Um, and says, what do you think about the lifting of the state of emergency? And the villager tells Wiseman, wagging his finger, he says, you write this down. And Wiseman says, what should I write down? He says, well, the lady told me to shut up. I have told her who has to shut up. <laughs> so even the most desperately poor care about the franchise, about the vote. We have uh, one more question in the back, and then I have a closing question very quickly, so please. Um, how do you envision the progress of cooperation within South Asia as a region? Because even though there are a lot of fundamental similarities, there's also a lot of very um, aggressive hostilities that exist. So, This is one of the least integrated regions of the world. Uh, you may well be aware of this yourself since you asked that question, but others in this audience may be unaware, and this is a fairly informed, literate uh, audience. It's impossible to fly from any number of cities in South Asia to another capital city directly. I recently had the experience of being in Kathmandu doing some work for the US government and wanting to fly to Colombo. I had to fly to New Delhi, cool my heels for several hours, then catch a flight which was late to Colombo. This makes sense in this day and age. We, there are no aircraft that can f fly directly from Kathmandu to Colombo. It's laughable. There are direct flights from Islamabad to New Delhi and New Delhi to Islamabad. But you can't go to Karachi. You have to go to Lahore and then catch an internal PIA flight to go to Karachi. This, is, this exemplifies how little cooperation has been accomplished despite the presence of an entity called SARC, the South Asian Asso Association for Regional Cooperation. Um, it is mostly cosmetic and in considerable part, it's because other disputes in, uh, in part hold Sark hostage, and I think also, to be quite candid, India could afford to be a much more generous neighbor to its weaker neighbors. But it has chosen not to be, in considerable part because of a paranoia that exists amongst in the corridors of power in New Delhi, that the neighbors will gang up on India. And this belief is pervasive in New Delhi. And consequently, this has blighted the prospects of cooperation. All right, so I have one last thought. Um, 
And this, this may be a, a very broad open question and hard to um, answer, frankly, so, so um, do as best you can with it. But if, if, w uh, one thing that often in talks like this that we don't have a chance to talk enough is about um, uh, younger generations. Uh, and I was kind of thinking as I sat here, if, if we had this, like this room, but with a room of students also from India, what would be the things that unite these people as they think about their place in the world, the relationship between these two countries, and that broader question of, of the future that they confront as a generation? The one thing they would immediately have in common with their American counterparts is, what do I do the day after I graduate? <laughs> 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 and most importantly, is there a job awaiting me? And what kind of job? And what kind of pathway does it open up for me? This is about the most compelling question facing India because it adds a million young people to its population every month. And, uh, you know, we complain about the costs of a college education in the United States, the, uh, the difficulties that parents experience in sending their children to college. In India, if you're fortunate enough to go to college, there is still no guarantee at the end of the day that you'll find employment. Uh, and as a consequence, there is an aspirational generation that is increasingly frustrated in India. Yeah. It's not, I mean, I say this with a bit of trepidation because she's a friend of mine uh, and mercifully uh, it got too late to review the book, not on my part, but on the part of the uh, uh, journal. And so I didn't get to review it and I'm grateful for that because the book is un terribly, terribly uneven and it's a series of vignettes. But if you know very little about India and want an answer to Professor Kay's question, it's worth reading with all its warts and unevenness. It's called An End to Karma, uh, and it's by Shomini Sengupta. Uh, she is a correspondent for the New York Times, or has been a correspondent for the New York Times in India, and was the first woman of Indian origin, though she had grown up in Berkeley, California, and had gone to school at UC Berkeley. She's of Indian origin, and she uh, was the first New York Times bureau chief in New uh, uh, in, of Indian origin in New Delhi, and it's based upon her reading. It's, it's not a very good book. It's a series of vignettes, and there's a kind of light motif that runs through the book. Uh, but as a kind of a, just a uh, superficial introduction to this subject, she does a good job of capturing this tremendous sense of aspiration. So that's the first part. The second is, Increasingly, the younger college-educated or uh, uh, generation in India wants to see India uh, acquire its place in the world. Um, and uh, not all of them uh, want to leave, leave India. They want many of the creature comforts that we have at home, which is a fundamental uh, sort of psychological transformation. Uh, that it's, you know, uh, I too want my iPad. You know, uh, I too want my uh, 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 smartphone. And it's within reach now, or it should be within reach. And the gap between that aspiration and that reality is really grating in India. And that could be the source of some social and political turbulence in the years ahead. Well, as you can see, we chose wisely on our speaker, and, and uh, you know, this is, a, in my opinion, a tour de force of some of the bigger questions confronting the world. So really want to thank uh, the Eddies, uh, Rock Jones, Jim Franklin, and in particular, my friend Shumit for making the trip here, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>